Hey, I'm J.D. Lehman. Thanks for listening to our Sunday message. We're excited about what God is doing in our community, in Oak Park, and in the Chicagoland area. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and greaterchicagochurch.com. And may goodness and mercy follow you all the days of your life. Um, Yeah, I'm just excited to bring a powerful word. Where's Millie when I need her? Happy birthday, Millie. I missed you this week. It was her birthday. Our former COO of the church um, always used to introduce me by saying I'd bring a powerful word. So I'm bringing that back. Um, You know, (laughs) I'm one of these guys who really likes plans and lists and, you know, I like things organized. I like things certain. Um, And here we are in the middle of uh, two and a half months of quarantine. You know, we just got another uh, notice from Pritzker, who is our governor, saying that, hey, you guys are going to be quarantined through the end of May. It looks like summer's canceled. Um, Yeah, I mean, things just don't always go as planned. And if that's where you're at today, hey, you're in the right place, because me too. And... um, you know, back to my list, I really wanted to have uh, the year laid out in this like beautiful order. I've got people who um, know how to make spreadsheets look really beautiful and it's all color coordinated. And here I am in the middle of it thinking like, ah, you know, this is really a wonderful topic, but it's not exceptionally relative, relevant to where we are right now. And so um, I'm tweaking things up a little bit today. Um, and uh, we are going to enter into our third piece of faith and doubt today, but it is going to be a little different. I, um, I basically threw away the thing and started over uh, because let's talk about what we're really going through right now. And um, yeah, kind of recap real quick. Let's see. The first one I introduced uh, faith and doubt And I said, you know, the opposite of faith isn't doubt, it's actually certainty. Because if we have certainty, we don't need faith for anything because it's going to happen. And then we did this little one on deconstruction and how deconstruction is this term that's out there right now. And a lot of people are talking about it, but is it bad? Is it good? What is it? I just kind of introduced what it is and, and we talked about it. And today was supposed to be, what do we do with people who are doubting? And what today is really going to be is how do we answer the questions that people are, are asking? Um, and I, I don't want to skirt away from the theological questions or, or like these giant ex- existential questions. Those are fine to have. Like, those are great. We're, we'll get to those, I promise, for those of you who are, are nerded out and you want to be in the lecture hall at the University of Chicago in a high-level uh, phil- philosophy class. Um, you want to have the conversation about the the metaphysics of whether or not this Zoom call is even existing, or if you're listening as a podcast, if, if it's really coming into your ears. Or, those are great questions. I'm not going to wrestle with the big doubt questions today. I'm going to wrestle with something else. Um, because when I talk to people, um, when I chat with people online, when I meet with them on Zoom, when I do a counseling session, they aren't really asking me whether or not I believe God exists. In fact, they aren't asking that question if God is real. Um, They're not asking, um, is it possible that God doesn't exist at all? They're, They're really asking other questions. And, And the problem is that when doubt enters into our grid, many times we have this, this thing where we dichotomize the answer, right? We say yes or no, either you're for me or against me. Either you believe in God or you doubt God, which means you don't believe in God at all. And I don't think that's what's going on. Um, and this like, this makes a fork in the road, right? And it makes us feel bad. It makes us, I don't know, it makes me feel, feel oh, I've got a doubt about this or something. It's like we equate it as opposite of faith and it's horrible. And I kind of want to pull that back again and talk about like, huh, that's really not what's going on. I look at it and I'm like, okay, here, here's where I see, where I see the questions coming in. I see questions of, um, is God good? 
in the middle of a pandemic is does God care today? Does God care that all this is happening to me, that there's economic collapse all around me, that I might lose my house, that I'm going to be late on my rent payment, that I can't pay for groceries? Does God care? Is God just? Like, is there any justice in this? Like, it seems like people who are really wealthy are fine. Um, It seems like people who are in different areas are completely fine. And here I am suffering. And is God listening to me? I'm waiting on God. Does, does that mean that God's waiting on me to do something? Is, is the ball in my court? Like these are the questions that I keep bumping into from people that I'm in contact with that friends that don't necessarily come to church friends that don't necessarily have a, a faith like you and I would talk about a faith. And yet that's where I'm getting all the traction. And let's be honest, some of the most famous people in the history of Christianity have been doubters, right? Like Martin Luther was a doubter. Um, And guys, like our tradition has embraced doubting, but since we've made this Western idea of like splitting doubt and faith into belief and complete unbelief, we've kind of broken that down. I, I read a book a while ago and I picked it up again as we were going through this and, um, it kind of responds to this idea of this question of does God exist? And um, it's a book by N.W. Clerk. It's called A Grief Observed. Uh, the author was posthumously revealed to be C.S. Lewis after he had passed away. Uh, but Lewis had been so scared to publish these ideas um, and his theological wrestle of doubt that he had published it under a pen name so that it wouldn't tarnish his reputation because he was scared of what people would think. And he writes this. Not that I am, I think, in much danger of ceasing to believe in God. The real danger is of coming to believe such dreadful things about him. The conclusion I dread is not so there's no God after all, but so this is what God is really like. Deceive yourself no longer. Here he is. He's just lost his wife. He's, he's in this place of like hurt and brokenness. And he's sitting there wrestling and saying, hey, you didn't answer my prayers. You haven't gotten me out of pandemic. You haven't healed my mom. You didn't heal my wife. And he's sitting there thinking, you know, I, I don't want to not believe God. I don't want to believe something that's not even about God. I want to know who God really is. I don't want to believe my version of the truth. Sometimes in in these times, like a pandemic time, we default to our own understanding, right? And we miss God's nature. We, We end up believing in the absence of something and we call it a solution, um, for how we think. Uh, Paul in writing to the Corinthians, Paul never got to stand with Jesus. Now he knew Jesus, right? He has the, this amazing experience on the road to Damascus. Um, but Paul never stood next to Jesus. And yet he's only a few years removed from Jesus. And he's writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 13. Um, he writes, he's writing this, this narrative about how he understands God, but he realizes that he doesn't have the complete understanding. He wasn't like Moses. And he writes, for now we see but a faint reflection of riddles and mysteries as though reflected in a mirror. But one day we will see face to face. My understanding is incomplete now, but one day I will understand everything. Just as everything about me has been fully understood. He's saying, look, I don't have the entire answer. I don't get it all, but, but Moses did. And someday I will too. And I think it's this idea of like, it's okay to doubt, like to say, I don't have all the answers. It's okay to not understand everything as though it's been dimly lit or in a mirror. And our response isn't to come at people and give them answers, Our response is not to come at people and give them answers. It's to sit with them and listen to them. 
and understand them and then lead them to the place where we have found peace. There was a, a German born theologian and philosopher. His name is Paul Tillich. And he lost his mother at 17 to cancer. He signed up uh, to be a chaplain in World War I. And um, he, he actually passed away here in Chicago uh, as he finished out his life. But he's got some great works out there. One of them is Dynamics of, of Faith. And he, he writes, doubt is a necessary element in faith. Living faith includes doubt about itself and the risk of courage. And um, I was thinking about that. And the essence of what he's asking is, how do I know what I know? And how do I know that it's true? And I'm probably going to butcher this word. I've tried all week to get this word correctly. But there's an, that, that idea is called epistemological doubt. I said it right. Epistemological twice. Come on. And it's, it's basically this idea. It's, it's where you're asking, how do I know what I know? And how do I know it's true? That's the, the fancy word for it. And I bet there's a lot of people that are listening to this either on the Zoom call or by podcast or, or later on uh, that you do this practically every day. Um, you, you question yourself and it's okay. You, you're just kind of going through the motions of it, but you might not have even heard this term. I find that this idea to be incredibly helpful when we're wrestling with our theological doubt, but we're also wrestling with pandemic doubt and we're also wrestling with just plain uncertainty. It's asking practical questions of yourself, like how do I know I'm on the right track in the way I live? And when someone asks you that, you know, and they say, how do I know? How do I know that I'm doing the right things right now? How do I know that this quarantining is right? How do I know that it's all going to be okay? And this is our chance to step in and bring truth. Or, you know, how do I know that what you say is true or right? Or how do I know that it's good? How do I know that I'm making the world a better place? These are huge questions to yourself. But as believers, we have like this grounding in this context for how we can start to walk those out. How do, what is the testimony? What is the wake? What follows behind me? Is it goodness and mercy? Are goodness and mercy the wake that I leave behind me? If that's your answer, then yes, you're on the right track. I believe that the kingdom is coming and that we are ushering in new and more powerful and more wonderful examples of God's love. Of course, it's dimly lit, lit in the reflection of a mirror. It can't be 100% perfect, but we can, we can start to work those things out. You know, people who are asking those questions or, or even asking the questions about like, is this, am I, even, am I even close to doing what God wants me to do? It's like, hey, you should have great hope because since the beginning of recorded history, people have been asking those same questions. David asked those questions. The other psalmists asked those questions. Job asked those questions. The prophets asked those questions. And was, in a way, Jesus even asked those questions. This is, this is what it means to, to be a believer. This is what it means to be relevant. This is what it means to be able to sit and listen to people. We have to avoid the, the trigger of going from unbelief being disbelief. We have to avoid the trigger of saying like, I'm questioning this. Oh, you don't believe in God. No, I'm just questioning. I don't understand why God's doing it this way. You know, it's like Psalm 42, our deep cries out to deep. Hey, this pain inside of me, I don't know how to, I don't know even who to, who to talk to. Deep cries out to deep. Maybe doubt is a sign that you're realizing the full, mysterious nature of God. And within that, there is our inability to understand how great and wonderful God is until we sit in the presence of the Most High when it's all said and done. I don't know. That kind of feels like where I'm at. You know, I'll, I'll kind of close it up with this, this, this story of the most prolific doubter in scripture, right? There's only one person whose name is attached to doubting and that's Thomas. 
And poor Thomas, you know, it's, he's doubting Thomas. And I remember the stories in Bible in Sunday school. And, you know, I think I've even told my kids these stories. And so it's like, okay, what, what do I really believe here? And if you'll think back to our Easter message about being in the garden, you know, Jesus um, wasn't recognized by Mary Magdalene in the garden. And then on the road to Emmaus, he wasn't recognized. And even when he busts into the upper room, walks through a wall, the disciples are like, ah, it's not Jesus. What is that? It's a ghost. And they all doubted. All of those people doubted. Every single one of them. And yet Thomas is the only one who we (laughs) equate to doubting because he didn't happen to be there on that first day. Well, we saw Jesus. Yeah, you saw Jesus and you didn't believe until you saw a way to put your fingers in the holes in his sides and in his hands. And I think that I think that's a misrepresentation of who Thomas was. The only other time in scripture that Thomas is really mentioned is in John 11 when he um, says, hey, I'm willing to go and die with you. You know, like he sold out. Thomas isn't doubting the relevance of God. This is a Jewish disciple who's been following his rabbi around for three years. This is a man who is committed to the end. But he wanted proof of the pain that Jesus had gone through. He wanted to see the same thing that Jesus had gone through. And I think sometimes we are so quick to answer people's doubt and questions and beat them over the head with answers of theology and religion that we don't sit with them and remember that those questions come loaded with a lot of pain and suffering, that people are hurting. And right now their questions aren't, does God exist? Yes, I believe God exists. My question is why in the world does this hurt so bad? Why am I so scared that I can't sleep at night? Why is everything about this entire situation causing anxiety in my life? Those are the pieces that I want to like come back into. Like our, our job is not to beat people over the head and tell them we have answers because they're doubting we have answers and their doubt means they don't believe. Our response is like, hey, like, oh man, hold up a second. Let me hear about how that hurt you. Let me sit with you. Let me be somebody that you can talk to. Let me tell you about how good and perfect and wonderful, and where I found peace, and where I found understanding, and though it's dimly lit through a reflection of a mirror through a telescope, or whatever it is, these are the things that are calming me right now. And so our response, our response to doubters isn't to like, beat them over the head, it's to sit quietly and say, hey, you know what, let me hear about your pain. Let me let me walk you through how I do it. And so As I kind of wrap this up, I want to extend an invitation to everyone who is currently in that place of you're questioning God as to why God is allowing the things to happen that are happening to you and your family, to our nation. Why is God punishing us? I don't believe that. I don't believe that at all. I believe that we serve a good father. And we serve a good God. And in our recognition of this, as we sit and we ponder and we ask, our job is to listen to what God is saying to us now. Don't let someone else listen for you. It's fine to get a word from the prophet. It's wonderful to have a prophetic word given to you. But listen for yourself. God is speaking now and wants to bring you into a place of understanding and deeper revelation. Doubt is okay. Doubt does not equal disbelief. Doubt is just a question. And together we get to question how good God is going to be going forward. Thanks for tuning in to GCC Online. We are a church that is passionate about looking more like Jesus. And we pray this message impacted you today. To find out more about us, to support our church, or to get involved, follow us on social media or head over to our website at greaterchicagochurch.com. We hope you have a blessed week.